Just before we dive into the video today, I do want to tell you about a fantastic sponsor, and that is AG1, which has become an absolute game changer for my daily routine. Look, life is busy, but this little gem is something I've incorporated into my wellness routine. It makes everything easier. It's AG1. First of all, the taste. Now, you might be a little bit skeptical looking at it because it is very green, but it tastes delicious. It's kind of like pineapple, little hints of vanilla. Easy. It's refreshing. It's not like chugging down a glass of, well, this very green looking thing. It tastes delicious. Plus, making it super easy, you just take a scoop out of here, you put it in the bottle, you shake it up, and you're good to go. AG1 covers all the bases from essential vitamins and minerals to probiotics, antioxidants, you name it, they cover it. Plus, because AG1 is all about giving back, here's something special for you guys. If you head to drinkag1.com forward slash shadows, you'll get a year's supply of immune supporting vitamin D. That's right there, comes in a bottle, plus five of these travel packs so you can stay healthy on the go. You can't put a price tag on your health. Big shout out to AG1 for sponsoring today's video, supporting my wellness journey, hopefully supporting yours as well. Support the show. Click the link below, try it out, and let me know what you think. And now, today's video. This is a story of Emmanuel Mwide, a man who pulled off the third largest banking fraud in history without hacking a single computer. His weapon? Audacious confidence. His target is a Brazilian bank and a gullible world. Nuide sold a phantom airport in a scheme so bold it defied belief, convincing the bank to part with a staggering $242 million. So today we're going to dive into the tale of deception, the art of the con, and the man who almost got away with it all. Now, not a lot is known about Nuide's early life, not even where or when he was born. It's believed that he was born somewhere between 1950 and 1955 in or near Lagos, Nigeria. He's also believed to have been born into poverty, something that even at an early age he was desperate to escape. Despite apparently coming from nothing and having little to no formal education, Nuide was a brilliant and ambitious young man, intent on making himself a fortune into the world of banking. He may have started at the bottom, but it was a quick rise to the top. Between his intellectual gifts, relentless work ethic, and natural charm, Nuide was able to make a name for himself and demonstrate his value to the Union Bank of Nigeria. When Nuide oh, was only in his 30s or very early 40s, he was named as the bank's director. For many people, this would be a dream come true. Nuide was now the director of the 14th largest bank in Africa, a position that would have included a considerable salary and benefits. And for someone with such an exemplary reputation, there was always the opportunity to seek out jobs at even larger financial institutions if he was looking to make more money. By any metric, this should have been an incredible success story. But Nuide wanted more. He wanted the sort of money that can buy power and influence. And he wanted it now. So he hatched a plan. It's a plan you're all too familiar with, as it's become synonymous with Nigeria in the Western world. An advanced fee scam. In modern times, it's commonly known as either the Nigerian print scam or the 419 scam, with 419 being the Nigerian criminal code for fraud. These scams promise the victim a share of a massive payout, but they have to make a comparatively small upfront payment that will allegedly be used to obtain the bigger payout. While we think of these today as generally being email scams that target the desperate or the elderly, they've existed for at least hundreds of years. But no financial institution was going to fall for such a crude ploy, so Nuide was going to need something much more sophisticated than your average typical advance fee scam. And because the year was 1995, it was fax machines rather than email that was the gold standard for business communications. Since a typical advance fee scam would never work, Nuide had to instead disguise his scam as a legitimate business proposal. The timing could not have been better for this either. In 1991, Abuja had been named the new capital of Nigeria, replacing Lagos. The population of Abuja had been increasing by around 10% every year for the past two decades, and by 1995 it had grown to over half a million people with no signs of that growth slowing down. It only made sense that a capital city with a large and ever-growing population would need an international airport, so he was going to seek investors that would like to finance it. Thanks to his job as director of the Union Bank, Nwide had access to a lot of personal information about some very important people in Nigeria. This would allow him and his accomplices to better impersonate officials later on, though not every identity they used was stolen. Some of them were completely fabricated, like the name that appeared on the very first fax sent by Nwide to solicit the attention of other banks. This fax contained a letter printed on official letterhead from the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation. It outlined their plans to build a new airport in Abuja and was signed by Tourista William. Though William 
William was allegedly part of the financial planning and budgeting department of the ministry, it was a completely fictitious person. And while the letter looked official enough, none of the banks that were contacted showed any interest at first. It seemed uh, like the plan was going to be a non-starter, until they received a reply from Nelson Sakaguchi, the director at Brazil's Banco Noreste. Banco Noreste had been looking for new investment opportunities, and this seemed like the perfect chance. Airports generated lots of revenue, so getting a major stake in an international airport in Nigeria's new capital could be a huge boon for the company. Noide called Sakaguchi while pretending to be Paul Ogwuma, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Though Ogwuma had only been a governor for a few years, he had made huge strides in restoring faith in Nigeria's financial institutions and was well known and respected in the world of international finance. Of course, he was only known by name. In the pre-internet days, it was essentially impossible to verify what Agwuma actually looked like. Nuide convinced Sakaguchi to meet with him to discuss the proposal for the airport in more detail, but he insisted that the deal needed to be kept strictly confidential. He wanted to meet somewhere in neither Nigeria nor Brazil, so he agreed to Sakaguchi's offer to meet in London. Nuide already had Sakaguchi on the hook, and once they were in London, it was time to reel him in. When Sakaguchi arrived at the airport, he was picked up by an expensive limousine and taken to his suite at a five-star hotel, all paid for by the Central Bank of Nigeria, as far as he knew. Once there, he met with Nuide, who presented himself as Paul Ogwuma, complete with a fancy business card. He was also accompanied by his accomplices, Emmanuel Ofulu, Naziribe Okolo, Obum Osakwi, Christian Ikakuchwu Anajemba, and his wife, Amaka Anajemba. Anajemba played the role of the deputy governor of the bank, with his wife standing in as the deputy governor's wife. The other conspirators impersonated other high-level officials, such as senior representatives from the Ministry of Aviation. Since this was meant to be a business meeting, Nuide was prepared with an incredibly elaborate proposal, including complete plans for the airport's construction and fake documentation to support the entire project. It looked like a well-thought-out business plan, and Nuide had already done a lot to build up his credibility by providing Sakaguchi with the luxurious suite. Everything seemed like the real deal, but there was one caveat. The reason that the plans were being kept confidential was that construction wasn't scheduled to begin for another four or five years. Sakaguchi was thoroughly convinced that this was a sound investment, and he agreed that Banco Noreste would transfer the money as soon as they were ready to break ground. Now, this obviously wasn't going to work, as no real airport was being built, so Nuide explained that they needed money to start flowing immediately. They weren't going to need all $191 million up front, but they needed to start hiring companies and acquiring tools and building materials, so they were going to need a stream of cash. It was clear that this made Sakaguchi a bit nervous, something that Nuide immediately picked up on. Nuide told him that if he had any concerns, that it was fine, as they had other investors lined up to talk to anyway. This wasn't the case, but given what a lucrative deal was being offered, Sakaguchi wouldn't have found it difficult to believe. But there was another problem. As director of foreign investments, Sakaguchi could never authorize such a large investment on his own anyway. He was only allowed to make investments up to $6 million each. Again, Nuide told him that this was fine and that they could just seek the funding from other investors. However, he also added that if Sakaguchi could work out the $6 million limit with Banco Noreste on his own, he would personally receive a $10 million commission from the airport's profits. Now, this offer was too good to pass up, especially because Sakaguchi seemingly had nothing to lose. Banks will sometimes make riskier investments than any of the people involved would ever personally make because they're using other people's money. This became such a problem that the United States actually has numerous regulations in place to limit risky investments by financial institutions. Sakaguchi's hesitance likely would have prevented him from personally falling for a Nuide scam, but since he was gambling with other people's money, the potential payout was too much to resist. Besides, Besides, it really looked like a legitimate proposal with an exceptional amount of detail and analysis. By the time Sakaguchi left London, he had already handed over a check for $35,000 to Nuide. All that was left now was to see how much they could take him and Banco Noreste for. With Sakaguchi now firmly in their pocket, Nuide and his gang were able to siphon large amounts of money from Banco Noreste through Sakaguchi. From 1995 through 1998, numerous payouts were made from Sakaguchi to Nuide, totaling $191 million in cash. Adding in all of the unpaid interest on that investment, the total fraud amounted to $242 million. And while Sakaguchi may have at least initially believed that this was a legitimate business deal, his actions seemed to indicate that he recognized what he was doing was a bad idea. Payments were made to different accounts at different banks, many in the Cayman Islands, to conceal where the money was coming from and going to. 
In Nigeria alone, 17 different banks were used to obfuscate the trail of the money. Money also passed through the United States, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and Switzerland, among others. Even worse, the banks being used seem more than willing to allow the illegal transactions to take place. Lloyds and Citibank are often cited as having been particularly negligent in the handling of the transactions. They reportedly violated countless rules regarding the opening of accounts and transfers of large sums of money in order to keep these wealthy customers happy. As time went on, Sakaguchi became more and more concerned about the situation. When he handed over the first check for $35,000, he was expecting an immediate return. This was the case with every payment he had sent on behalf of bank owner Este. Every time he sent Mide a few million dollars, he seemed to believe that this time he would finally start to receive a return on his investment. As the months turned into years and the total kept climbing, he began to fall victim not to Mide's scam, but to the sunk cost fallacy. He had already invested so much of the bank's money in this business venture that he couldn't stop until he saw it to completion. Beginning to fear what seems like an inevitably disastrous outcome from all of this, Sakaguchi decided to employ the services of Maria Rodriguez, a Macumba priestess. For only $10 million of Banco Noreste's money transferred from the Cayman Islands to Rodriguez, she purchased 120,000 white doves. The birds were released as part of a ritual to free Sakaguchi from his problems. When this didn't work, Rodriguez was paid another $10 million to perform a similar ceremony using black doves. Again, it didn't work, and Sakaguchi's worries continued to mount. <laughs> this cannot be real. Bafunuide! Bafunuide and his gang, things could have been better. They were. <laughs> Go, Dubs! Be free! Free me of my worries! <laughs> They were receiving millions of dollars which they invested by purchasing real estate around the world as well as stakes in businesses. They were very talented at this and their investments rose in value far faster than they could have predicted. It seemed like nothing could go wrong for Nuide until an unrelated business deal blew the lid off the entire scam. In 1997, Spain's Santander was looking to buy Banco Noreste for $500 million. As part of the deal, they of course would need to look at Noreste's financial statements. Jamie Lopez of Banco Noreste was in charge of compiling all of the pertinent information, but he was becoming increasingly frustrated with this task. It appeared that nearly $200 million, about a third of the bank's capital, are always located overseas in the Cayman Islands. The only person who would have known the details of these transactions was Sakaguchi, but whenever he was asked to provide the information, he kept delaying and making excuses. Following a meeting with the bank's board, in which Sakaguchi again attempted to stall, Lopez grabbed him in the hallway by the collar and demanded that he hand over the past three years of financial transactions immediately. It was the first time anyone had ever seen Sakaguchi not in control of a situation, and he weakly replied, You know, I've always had gambling in my blood. It was hardly the sort of statement you'd want to hear from someone in charge of bank investments, but Lopez finally was able to uncover the truth of what had been happening. A massive investigation was launched involving all the banks used in these transactions, and it was discovered that the money had been funneled to Nigeria. However, the Nigerian banks didn't want to cooperate with the investigation on account of the bribes that they had been paid by Nwide. They eventually gave in to pressure from Western banks, and they gave up the names of the account holders. Nwide and his gang had been discovered, but there was still a problem. Nigeria had a major lack of laws at this time regarding financial fraud. Sakaguchi, who had at least begun as an unwitting victim, was arrested, while Nwide and his accomplices were free. To further complicate matters, because all of the money had been invested in things like real estate, it seemed that it would be impossible for bank owner Este to recover their money. It wasn't until 2002 that Nigerian President Alusagan Obasanjo and the Nigerian Parliament created the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, or EFCC. In 2003, investigations opened opened into Nuide and his accomplices, and in 2004, Nuide and four of his co-conspirators were arrested. The other had died previously in a car crash. The gang was charged with 86 counts of fraudulently seeking advance fees, to which they all pled not guilty. They were charged in Abuja, where Nuide began trying to bribe jurors and court officers. The case was eventually moved to Lagos, where the new judge warned Nuide about trying to bribe court staff. Not eating the warning, Nuide went to Nuhuribada, head of the EFCC, and offered him a bribe of $75,000 in cash. The bribe was turned down, and Nuide's trial continued as planned. While again entering a plea of not guilty in Lagos, things changed once Sakaguchi was brought in to testify. After hearing the testimony, Nuide changed his plea to guilty in the hopes of receiving a more lenient sentence. It arguably worked. 
as Nuide was sentenced to five terms of five years each in prison to run concurrently rather than consecutively. His assets were confiscated so Nororeste could recoup their losses, and he was ordered to pay a fine of $10 million to the EFCC. But thanks to a few more bribes, Nuide would serve less than two years of his five-year sentence before being released. Once he was out of prison, Nuide filed a lawsuit against the government for seizing his assets. According to his complaint, many of the assets that were seized had been acquired before his illegal activity, and as such, there was no right to confiscate them. It didn't hurt that his real estate investments had paid off either. An assets recovery lawyer tasked with handling Nuide's London property stated, the houses had increased in value so much that we were able to cover a good deal more than we had first anticipated. And that was only one city in which Nuide had purchased property. There was plenty to pay back, Banco Nareste, and still have a lot left over. Whether that factored into the court's decision or not can't be stated with any certainty, but the Nigerian courts allowed Nuide to reclaim a large portion of his assets. Sources vary, but to date, he has reclaimed at least $50 million and possibly as much as $150 million in assets that were originally seized following his conviction. There seems to have been very little fallout for Nwide following his incredible scam. He has remained a wealthy and influential figure in Nigeria since being released from prison. And in 2016, he was also arrested for murder. The town of Akpo was attacked by 200 people due to a land dispute with the neighboring Abagana community. During this attack, four police officers were shot and a security guard was killed. It was believed that Nwide was the ringleader behind the attack, and he was arrested and charged with murder, attempted murder, and terrorism, among other charges. He was released on bail, and the charges appear to have been dropped. A few years later, he was elected the President General of Ugbene Town Union, serving in that position until early 2023. Though more charges were filed in 2021 for forgery of property documents related to his original scam from the 90s, there have not been any major developments in that case, and it appears though it may have been dropped. For the man who was found guilty of orchestrating the third largest bank fraud in history, there have been virtually no consequences. But for Sakaguchi, things haven't ended nearly as well. He was charged in Switzerland with money laundering and was sentenced to 30 months in jail, of which he served almost two years. After being released from prison, he returned to Brazil, where he sold many of his assets to pay off his debts as well as to pay for college for his children. Sakaguchi struggled to find work following his incarceration. He even bought a truck and tried growing and selling produce, but community backlash against him caused this modest endeavor to fail as well. Then in 2009, he found himself in court again, this time in Brazil. Sakaguchi was again charged with money laundering and was sentenced to six years in prison. There's no information about what happened to him following the completion of that sentence, but it's all a harsh reminder of how much these scams can ruin a person's life. <laughs>